Welcome to Art Through My Eyes with Mopi Kaigua. I have over 40 years of experience in performing on stage, in film and on television. And you've come to the right place if you're looking to find out about the performing arts in Kenya. I've performed in Europe, in East Africa, in America, and my plays have been performed all over the world. I've received a number of awards, including three Lifetime Achievement Awards from South Africa, Tunisia and Egypt. If you're looking for a place where you can find out about the performing arts in Kenya, then you've come to the right place. Come with me. Welcome back. We've talked about Heart and Soul and how it was made. We've had one episode where we gave you an introduction, then a second episode where we talked about the auditions and the acting workshops, then we talked about the production process, and now in episode four, I'm going to talk about how Heart and Soul was scripted. We have here my archive and I have um, newspaper clippings, I have character bibles, I have shooting scripts, I have tapes from the Swahili version of Heart and Soul and I would like to take you around this world and tell you how exactly we made Heart and Soul. So the way that the writing process began was, first of all, we had to recruit writers. And there wasn't that much experience in writing soap opera, so we um, asked for people to apply. Once they applied, we chose 16 people. Four of them were storyliners, and I'll explain that in a minute, what a storyliner does. And uh, 12 of them were writers. We wrote two scripts based on a real world that we had created with real characters. Those scripts were sent out to a research company that then did focus group discussions. Those focus group discussions then um, approved certain characters, uh, asked us to change certain ideas that we had as to how the story should be told. Um, and then once they came back, we wrote four more um, we wrote four more scripts. So in all, we had six scripts as a pilot, and this pilot was then broadcast on, on television. So what we decided as the storylining is that these characters needed to be appealing to the public. So we had a family who were pretty much well off and another family who were not so well off and there, there was a connection between the two families because the matriarch of the family that was not well off worked for the family who were well off as um, a housekeeper, house help. And then there was a son who also in the poorer family worked in the bar of the family who were a bit richer. So. One of the things that you do with soap opera is you create a world that is easily accessible, that is familiar to your audiences. So we had a doctor with her family. We had a woman who lived with her family and was working as a domestic worker in the richer family. And we had a bar. So everybody can identify with a family that looks like this, a family that looks like that, and the bar. And so this is where people gathered, and this is how the story unfolded. One of the things that we did was to develop a character Bible. And a character Bible, um, if I can just um, 
look on my here. A character Bible is going to tell you about the lives of these two families that I've already described. So each of the characters, the Mellies, who are the richer family, who live in like a grander house, each of those characters, there's an, there's an age. If I can read just a little bit about, um, for instance, Grace Melly, she's 62. She currently lives on the family's modest coffee plantation, some miles out of town. She's recently widowed. Her, the death of her husband is what brings the program to a start. She hails from a large family of seven sisters and one brother, of whom only one brother and Grace survive. The youngest child, the apple of her father's eye, she's spoiled, she's manipulative, and already you can already see this person. This is somebody who you maybe even can identify as somebody who is a friend of a friend or a relative of yours. And so when we begin to write the things that come out of her mouth, we write her as a 62-year-old manipulative woman, and that kind of becomes easier for the writer to write because we have a description of her. And that's what the Bible does for you. One of the things that we did is we had an application process where we chose 16 writers. Of these 16 writers, they varied in age, they varied in social background, they varied in experience, they varied in gender. And as we began to write, we began to realize that some people wrote really well for the thugs, some people wrote really well for the older women, some people wrote very well for the younger generation. And so in my notes, I would um, make a note of who is writing which particular scene and which characters appear in that scene. And then we would try and put it all together in a way that was cohesive. I think that one of the things that we learned as we were learning how to storyline and as we were learning how to write a Bible is that there are elements of the story that the audience knows. So maybe there's a secret. The audience already knows the secret, but the characters who are in the show don't know something about a particular character. What was it eight years ago when little Joshua was taken away from you? And in the same quarry too. Yes, eight years. What's the day today? Eight years ago this week. And that then creates a kind of tension because the audience knows some things, but they're still waiting on the edge of their seats for things that might be revealed later on. One of the ways that the secrets played for us as writers, for instance, we had a piece of paper where we wrote the ghosts from the past. Um, and it's stories for the, these first six episodes. So for instance, um, Grace Melly is the matriarch in the richer family that I described, and she has a son called Benja. She got pregnant when she was quite young, so she really doesn't like Benja. When he talks, she doesn't hear him because she feels as if he kind of ruined the trajectory of her life. And so she, there's an animosity between the two of them. She has another son called Manu, Emmanuel, and Emmanuel is like her, her pet. So Benja, who is a lands officer and has, you know, sort of stuff up his sleeve and is always kind of interested in doing something, um, we would say corrupt, is planning now that his father has died to um, grow roses. He thinks that it's going to be great, uh, but because this is a UN-funded uh, storyline, this is the way that we're going to show how there's environmental damage within the storyline, because roses are very uh, damaging to the environment. Rose farming. Look, brother, properly managed, this farm could bring the family big profit. We must both look ahead. Yes, yes. Maybe move into another area? This idea of mine, flowers. Hey, Benja, business later, of course. 
Anyway, mother would never agree to that sort of change. It's not our farm anymore, is it? And it's not ours either. Not yet. But I am the eldest now. If we do this thing, it will sort your problems out, won't it? Oh. So he has this idea, and this is a secret that he keeps away from his mother and keeps away from his wife, and he's got this guy right at the very beginning of episode one who's looking at the soil, and he, even as his father is being buried, he's about to start taking over the land from his mother. Very familiar story, even today. What do you want? This is private property. Are you the owner? No, I am the manager. Were you coming for the funeral? No, man. I was just passing by. Some good soil here. The road is down there. Easy, man. Easy. It's a nice day. Finally, if you'd like to know more about Heart and Soul, or more about my work, or more about the work that I've done, then come to my website, www.mumbikaigua.com. And remember to like and share this video and subscribe to my channel.